know it's in and out a little bit. If at any point you can't hear me, just make some movement and I'll try to hold, try to eat the mic. My name is Sharon Fialco, and um, I've been asked to facilitate this evening's meeting. What that means to me is that it's my job to make sure that folks have a chance to be heard and hopefully to make sure that as many people as want to speak have a chance to be heard. Um, you all can help me out with that. If you're a person who tends to kind of hold back and be quiet, I encourage you to step into the space and share some of your thoughts tonight. And if you're one of the people kind of like me who's super comfortable talking and tends to take up ample space in meetings, Consider sharing a bit of your piece and then sitting back so that there's room for everyone to really have their piece. The co-op has a really large decision in front of ourselves, whether or not we're going to move. So tonight, there's a meeting. This meeting is set up with two purposes. One is to get some information out, to share information so that folks kind of have something to chew on and start to have a sense of what's involved in the possibility of the move. So we have some presentations. Based on these presentations, at the end of them, I'll take questions, kind of clarifying questions, questions to make sure you understood what they asked, questions that actually have an answer, not questions that uh, require an opinion to answer. So I'll take clarifying questions at the end of the presentations and then we're going to shift gears into this discussion part, which is really the chance to talk with the folks that are here and listen to each other and try to digest and process all this information that's in front of us. And um, for, fortunately, we have a great turnout tonight. So for this discussion part, we'll break into small groups so that folks really have space to be able to talk. And then at the end of the small groups, we'll come back to the large group and share some of what was in there so that nobody really missed anything. Okay? So, let me do a couple of logistics here. One is it's very important that everybody's comfortable, so I personally will not be offended if anybody needs to stand up, move, walk around the edges. As long as you're not walking right across the front here, I think we're pretty good. There's an outhouse over there, freshly stocked with toilet paper, if anybody needs it. And the other logistical piece is that, everyone wave to Leaf, we are being recorded. Hello Leaf. Um, this is HCTV, and tonight's meeting will eventually be on their website if people want to see it, or if you want to refer somebody else to be able to watch it, and also on cable station or channel 1080, 1080. If there's anybody here that is uncomfortable being recorded as they ask a question, Please um, take your question to the back where Catherine is. Hello, Catherine. So there'll be paper and pens there so that if you want to write down your question, then either I or somebody else will be able to read it for you and you won't have to be recorded. That's an option if you want it. Okay? Are there any other logistical questions? Anything I forgot before we get started on logistics? First meeting, group, last week, was that recorded? Yes, both meetings are being recorded. The first one was uh, eight days ago, and now this is the second one. The third group meeting will actually be our annual meeting, the co-op's annual meeting, which will be on October 10th. So, oh, the last uh, logistical thing is that Catherine is in the back corner there. If there's anybody here who is not a co-op member and would like to be a co-op member, you are encouraged They want to be co-op members, too. <laughs> you are encouraged to um, head back to the corner table where Catherine is sitting, and you can sign up to be a member. Once you sign up to be a member, you are eligible to share in this vote to help make the decision. The voting will be October 10th to the 24th. Is that correct? All right. So before we get to the vote, we're at getting information out and discussing it so that we're all informed as we make this decision. Yes. Do you expect these videos to be available before the vote? That's what I was told. The last one was put up on our website today. Thank you. can go to our website and find it. On the co-op's website. The co-op's, yeah. There's a move page with all the information. Okay. 
So with that, we're going to move into the info outs part. We're going to start with Annie, who is the board chair. All right, my name is Annie Gilliard. For those of you who don't know me, um, I have a long history of the co-op. I joined a month after it opened in 1975. Um, I became officially employed in 1985. Um, I'm still working there. I'm also the president of the board. Um, so this is a big deal, obviously. Um, this has a long history this uh, potential move to the other building. About uh, six years ago at our annual meeting, five or six years ago at our annual meeting, there was um, some discussion about the limitations of our space. Uh, and um, the Harvard Gazette reported that meeting and it came out in the paper and shortly thereafter, the Trags, who are the owners of the Harvard Village Market, approached the board uh, saying that they were interested in selling their business. Um, but we had to sign a non-disclosure agreement which meant that we couldn't talk to anybody but us board members. Um, so that's a little challenging. I don't think that the tracks really understood how a co-op operates and that's fine. Um, but it does operate that it's a member-owned business. So that means we have uh, 1,500 owners, not just one or two or three people that own the business. So it's the decision-making process is definitely different. So for the board to kick this idea around for um, two months and not be able to talk to anybody was really difficult. It did help us to start exploring what this could look like um, and uh, on many levels. Uh, debt being the first one, it's about as scary as when you probably took out that mortgage on your house or even a car loan, that first car loan when you were like, you know, maybe a teenager or in your early 20s. It's a little scary. Um, and, uh, and also just the logistics of it um, on, on many levels. So we kicked it around for a couple months and realized that we didn't feel comfortable making that kind of a decision without being able to talk to our members. So we kind of, we let it drop. Meanwhile, um, life at the co-op continued. Um, and in the ensuing years, we went from a collective management team to a uh, general manager. And we were approached about at that same time by one of our members um, who loves to look at real estate si um, sites and came to the store and said, hey, did you hear the village market is on the, on, for sale, it's on the market. And, um, and so we had that kind of aha moment of, oh, it's public now. We can actually talk about this. So, but because we were in that transition, we really didn't go very far into that discussion. We were busy dealing with transitioning our management. Um, and then COVID hit. Um, so more transition that we had to ride that wave. And, uh, it made us really realize, um, as if we didn't know, at least the staff wasn't partly aware of the limitations of our space, it made us really realize the limitations of our space. <laughs> when you're trying to maintain six foot distance between people and only let a certain amount of people in the store, and it, it was crazy. So as the COVID thing started to settle a little bit, we then approached the TRAGS and said, uh, are you still interested in selling the store because it had been taken down off the real estate website? And they um, said yes, and we then started negotiations with them, which we obviously have now made more public because we are able to do that. So that's the history of where we got to today. The history of a cooperative is, is that it is a member-owned business, and the members as owners can help make decisions based on the store that they co-own. Within that, the board technically could have made this decision by itself without involving the members, but none of us felt comfortable doing that. In fact, in this process of reaching the decision to move ahead on this, we had two board members resign from the board um, and we ha during that vote process. And we had two members abstain uh, in the voting process, but in the end there was a simple majority that said, let's go ahead and, and do this. So 
it is not without its own controversy and feelings of eek change or eek finances or eek all the things that you can freak out about when change happens. Um, but here we are today at our second informational meeting and um, really what it's come down to is the limitations of our space are real. Uh, we have a um, all our founding members are now senior citizens. <laughs> we know that it's handicap inaccessible. Um, we know that parking's a drag. Uh, we know that deliveries are a drag. And um, it's just, it's not working. Um, however, we also know, just because of this became public, that there's many people that regularly use the Hardwick Village Market uh, as their grocery store, whether they don't have transportation to get to Tops or whether they don't like going other places, that is a popular market. And they are nervous that we would kick them all out and just set up our, uh, set up our operations the way we've already set them up. So that brings us to part of this purchase price included the inventory. So we, we're looking at how can we blend the inventory as much as we are wondering how can we blend the cultures in this really divided world that we live in right now that's really intriguing to the board that has been kicking this around for quite a few months in, or now um, how can we be a true community market to our entire community um, so on that note, I'm going to wrap this up and um, turn it over to David to um, discuss that. And um, thank you for being here. There you go. Okie dokie. Hi, everybody. Hi. My name is David Luke. I'm pretty new here. I've been living in the area for 10 years. I've been on the board maybe six years, not all at once. I had a break for about a year and a half. And when I was first on the board, we were approached by the drags, and I knew we weren't ready. And so when this, this came up again, um, I'd had a lot of years to think about it. And I'm going to deliver similar to what I did last week, which is to emphasize that that store isn't just an empty building. It's, this is a town of about 3,000 people. And given several other thousand people that pass through on the roads. Some, some people seasonally, some people every day going to their jobs, going to visit their families. Oh, we serve a community that's a lot bigger than that. And there's countless relationships and family history and life and love that's put into this town. And so there's a responsibility over there, same as ours at the co-op, to provide a good and fun and really meaningful experience of coming in with your neighbors, buying your food, taking it home, cooking it for your family. Same, same thing happens. There's three stores in town, right? They all do about $2 million and they all serve a huge population here. So I got thinking around this, it's, and I made a little goal, right, that could fulfill, you know, the needs of, of us. We need a little more space and fulfill the responsibility of taking on another store in town that's been serving people since it was Pete's Meat Market before I was born. And then that turned into halls. And then it turned into the Harbuck Village Market. So this is what I wrote. This is my little goal. And I'm going to share it with you all. 
I want to see our co-op become a hub for the entire community. I want to see the farms and fields and woodlots full of produce and people and wildlife. I want to see the topsoil thick and rich with life. I want Hardwick to be filled with growing, healthy families, families who love it here and are invested in this community. I want to see us emphasize local food, soil health, and resilience and serve the surrounding community. And having a, a clear vision about what I wanted made it easy to support this move um, in the end, although I, I struggled with it for months. You know, this is, this is the only home I've had, you know, for 10 years, and I, I want to see this place be healthy. That's all I have to say. You wake them? So I'm Emily Hirschberger, the general manager at the co-op. And there are two things I want to go over with you. One, some of the financial information. Catherine Bessie, who did our financial feasibility study, was not able to attend tonight. I can do a quick summary. If you want all the details that she presented last time, you can go see the video that is on our website. Um, I'm also going to answer a couple of frequently asked questions that we've received already. So we'll start with the finances. So first of all, what is a feasibility study and why do you do it and how do we choose CDI? So a feasibility study, we looked at two things, market feasibility and financial feasibility. In the market feasibility, a large part of that was a survey we did at the end of 2019, I believe it was, um, where we had 700 people respond from our community. We're working on getting that posted on our website. For now, we have a summary, a you know, six-page summary instead of a hundred-page summary, of uh, both the financial and the market feasibility are up. Um, we'll get more of the market feasibility up soon. There's some information that isn't ours to share about other businesses' financials, and once we get that removed, we will post it for everyone to see. Um, so CDI is Cooperative Development Institute. They are for the Northeast, based in the Northeast. Catherine herself is in, from Maine. And they asked these questions. They collated the answers for the market feasibility. And then with the finances, we sent them our finances. They got finances from the village market. They looked at our expenses, their expenses, and lined them all up. Um, looked at what it would cost. What do we have to invest? Do we have enough money saved up to be healthy? Um, and came up with some answers to that and did a five-year projection out of like what would it need to look like over the next five years to make this viable. In a nutshell, to make it work, we would need to double our sales in five years, which if you're going into a space that's about three times the size as we have now, that's a relatively conservative goal. And especially if we're looking to mix our product lines and have a little bit bigger of a market for the whole uh, bigger, pro more products for the whole community. Um, so that's one of the metrics to know. Another one is, so no one is going to know exactly what happens here in Hardwick with finances and how stores are going to run, but what you can do is look at metrics from other similarly sized co-ops in similarly um, sized towns and communities. And right now, and so one of the big metrics you can look at is sales uh, per square foot. For every square foot of the co-op, how much money are we making on average? And right now, the co-op is at 1,100 sales per square feet, which is pretty much the max that we can do in that size space. There's like a little bit of leeway, we can go a little higher. And in some of the research I've read, that's an indicator that a smaller co-op should consider moving because they're kind of maxed out. Um, for co-ops that are a little bit bigger space, like the size of the village market would be, um, the average sales per square foot, I believe, is between like 600 and 900, somewhere in there. But in order to double our sales in five years, we have to get to $800 per square feet, which is completely, according to the research, doable for a co-op of our size. Um, so metrics like that can help us better understand if these targets are going to work in the, the whole scope will work. Um, 
part of the feasibility study does include their inventory because that is part of the sale. And they said that if you want to buy the business in the building, you need to buy the inventory as well. So we have these conventional products that we will be buying, so what do we do with them? And so the feasibility study does show like how do we maintain some of them? Are we going to phase them out? Are we going to keep them? And it has a couple scenarios for that as well. So that's a really quick nutshell um, on some of the targets and the feasibility. Next, I'm going to answer some questions. One of the biggest questions, which I think is wonderful, that we've gotten, because people are emailing or sending in comments in different ways, is what's going to happen to the staff at the village market. And a lot of the uh, questions or opposition to the move are folks who aren't necessarily co-op members that are very concerned about the folks that work at the village market. And it isn't our intention to get rid of their staff. And in fact, if we do want to be a market of choice for the whole community, we need to welcome and incorporate some of their staff into our staff as well, and vice versa. Um, and we've met with their staff once so far, and we'll continue to meet with them and get to know them and better understand how the two businesses would be working together. Um, Thank you, Mom. <laughs> okay, so um, particularly for folks that showed up after we got started, we are in this part of the meeting, which is the information out. We had some presentations. Now's the time for questions, clarifying questions, to make sure that everybody understands what was presented. If you have questions that uh, have a opinion as an answer or philosophical questions or questions to make people sit and think, oh, what would the answer to that be? Save those questions for the next section, okay? So right now, does anyone have any questions about the information material that was already presented? presented. Yes. Um, well, I think it was Emily was saying that, that the village market is a thriving business. And, and when I was in the small discussion group uh, last week, uh, it was said that they, they're not divulging the economics, the finances of that business. And it, it's always been my impression that they weren't doing well at all. So I, I'm wondering... So do we have information about the current finances of the current village market? They've been completely transparent with us. We're just not at liberty to share it with everybody else. Our finances will show you. So we've seen all their financial information and that's been included in the study. We just can't share that with you. It's not ours to share. So when you say thriving, you, you mean thriving? It's yeah. Thriving. Yeah. Um, one, two, and then three. Um, so in terms of purchasing the inventory, is that a non-negotiable uh, thing for them? The question was, is it non-negotiable in terms of um, buying the current inventory? And the answer is yes, it is now non-negotiable. That was part of the purchase and sale agreement, correct? We tried to negotiate. Yeah. What happens if we're not able to um, meet our revenue goals? What, what happens then? So let's take this as a clarifying question. Was there any information in the um, financial studies or feasibility studies that um, investigated what happens if we can't meet our financial targets? Oh, I stand yeah, right the mic, there. Okay. Yeah. Um, the goal of the feasibility study is to see what would be feasible. And the way they set it up is it's very conservative. It's not like looking to triple our sales because if traditionally if you look at a, a space, you'd be like, oh, it's three times as big, we can sell three times as much. That's not our goal. It's like a much more conservative number than that. Um, so the goal of the feasibility study isn't to go into scenarios of what happens if it doesn't work. It's more like let's throw a bunch of scenarios at it and see if any of these are not going to work. And so far, the scenarios that we ran have not shown that. Also, um, there are unknowns when you're starting up a business, which is basically what we're doing. There are fund. There's a lot of funding out there as far as grants and resources and short-term loans and I think that um, 
it's a problem we would have to solve if that came up, but I think there's a lot of resources out there to help us with it. Yes, and I think another big aspect is some of the work that we've done already at the co-op. I've worked a lot with the buyers, breaking down our budget into a quarterly basis to look at our goals and targets so we don't get to the end of the year and like, oh my goodness, what happened? It's like we're checking in on it every few months with the goal of if we see something that's not working, it gives us some time to have an intervention before we get to a place of desperation. if you've looked at trying to sell some of the inventory that you have to buy you know, to another small market or donate it, just because I'm not opposed to the market serving the co-op and serving the people that were shopping there before, but there may be some things that we don't want to sell, and we also need to have room to sell the things that the co-op is always selling. So the logistical question, should I restate some of the question? Could everybody hear that? Yes, you could hear it. Okay. So the question is, is it an option to sell some of the inventory that we're buying? Um, theoretically, yes. But when you have, you have a really small margin in a grocery store. You get something, you get like 30% of it. When you like the three make 30% off of that. When you pack up a good and ship it to another store, you don't make any margin. In fact, the Trags own another grocery store. We're like, why don't you just take some of this to your other store? And it just doesn't make, they would like lose money in doing that. Um, that said, we can geek out on grocery a little bit. If you go into the store and look at it, a lot of their um, products are double or quadruple faced. Meaning, if you look at them, it's not just one item on the shelf, there's multiple items. If you look at the co-op, we started to do a little bit of that, but we've traditionally had like a single facing. It means you have more back stock and you have to do more stocking. But I think there's a potential in that space to greatly expand products that are in there. Um, and yes, we would have to reduce some of the products that they sell now. We couldn't continue to sell them. Um. Wow, so many questions. Yes. Okay. Um, wow. Uh, mine's short. Mine's real short. One, two, three, and then this side of the room. Four, five, six, seven, eight. You all help me remember that. So there are three on the side. Yes. <laughs> yep. Oh, and again, um, well, for clarifying questions as much as we can about what's already been presented. Uh, just a clarifying question about the remodeling cost. Yep. Um, is a loading dock at all in that budget? So is there a loading dock in the renovation costs? A loading dock or moving cost? No, a loading dock to be So there is no loading dock currently at the Village Market, and the question is, do any of the renovation costs include putting a new one in? And the answer is no. Would we ever consider it? If you look at where they do get, if you look at how they get their product now, they back down along the side of the building, and it gets offloaded on the pallet, wheeled into the space, and then offloaded off the pallet on a conveyor belt that goes around. So they actually have a pretty good system, way better than what we've got now, because it goes right into the storeroom. So there, there is no, if you had a loading dock, you can't really do one down grade, which is where they offload stuff, and you can't do it upgrade because then you're offloading right into the store, which is a, which we already know that that's a drag. <laughs> so does that answer that? So there's stock rooms in the basement? Like well, the, the entire room. footprint of that store is repeated in the basement, and it is there. They have a small office there, and the rest of it is all storerooms and uh, the meat processing area. So is there a freight elevator or close to there is a There is a um, conveyor belt that goes up the stairs, okay. or up next to the stairs. Uh, it's it's pretty slick for being a funky old building and how they've made it work. It definitely works better than our funky old building and how it doesn't work. <laughs> so, thank you. Carol, do you have a Yes. That's a comment she made before about who are we required to sell their conventional inventory. 
and I wondered, was anything in the feasibility study, was there any thought of making the, the store part smaller so that the basket, so that the square foot on retail would have to be X, and then making the other side of the store rental spaces where we could get bigger, bigger income to people who have business models that are more in line with ours. So we don't have to sell conventional food, but we still make money so right now there's two small independently owned grocery stores in town and we have our friends over at the corporate tops and when we're buying that store we're essentially sh shouldering a responsibility to feed our neighbors. And I, you know, I'm gonna keep going back to the responsibility we have to this town and the people who made this town a place we love. And the way that we grow and change with each other is by being in relationship. And so I'm going to continue to point us in that direction and remind us of that. You. So I'm going to also take that as a clarifying question, in addition to a philosophical one. <laughs> um, <laughs> the question was, can we resell? Can we resell? No. Ask, ask again the question about the product. Well, I heard two parts. So was there in the feasibility study an option of shrinking the retail part? Was that part of the feasibility study? No, it was part of the early discussion, but it was not part of the feasibility study. Okay, thank you. At the table, yes. Yeah, Doug from the Gazette. Have you had any kind of clarification in your discussions thus far? I know you said you're not going to stock cigarettes, tobacco, that kind of thing, lottery, uh, about what products you will or will not carry that are current works of the co-op stock that are more conventional in nature, and uh, how long do you intend to keep this going? So have there been any decisions made yet about what things definitely will not be carried and continued, short term or long term? Cigarettes and lottery, that's it. The only, did you hear that? The only decision so far is no cigarettes and no lottery tickets. Everything else is still in the works. Okay, now I had a slew that, that over here. My, that was yours? Great. And then Paul, were you next? Yeah, I, I have several, and hopefully they're all short, clarifying financial questions. So. David mentioned $2 million in grocery sales, and was that per store or for the entire town? Three, $2 million businesses, about. Some from a little higher. If you, you count liquor, that looks bigger. But it's about all in the same ballpark. And Emily mentioned the uh, income per square foot. Is that monthly or annual? 1100 Per. You mentioned a thousand. The co ops. All right. I would yeah. think, but I, yeah. since it, we didn't have units, I thought I'd ask. Not Danny. <laughs> Got it. Um, so, um, with the plans and the loan needed, how close? To the value of the current village market property plus the value of the current Buffalo Mountain Co-op property is the loan you expect to take out. In other words, what's the debt to asset ratio exclusive of inventory? I'll do my best with that one. Um, so when you get a loan for a project like this, you get a loan for the, the assets, the, the building. And then when you talk about fixtures, equipment, things like that, that's not something a bank usually covers. So we're also talking about working with VITA on that. And all those are subject to appraisal to make this sure this will go through. Does that answer your question? And we have money, uh, the co-op has money to invest that we want to put towards inventory. We don't really want to take out a loan on inventory. is for us members who are being asked to have some 
involvement in the decision, that seems a critical piece of, I mean, we can, we can vote on our hearts, but understanding the numbers might be valuable too. So is that, is, is there more detail available on, on the actual asset values we're dealing with here? Um, that's going to be, once again, subject to appraisal that will happen in the next six weeks about what the assets are appraised at. But if you look at the appraisal cards from the town, it looks realistic. It, I mean, it looks like we're in the ballpark. And also, like, we haven't been able to really move forward on this too much. Um, and we're just now investigating all that. And that's contingent. Like, this is one of the contingencies to buying it is to make sure the financing comes through. Signed the purchase and sales agreement two weeks ago, so we're we're still in the somewhat early baby phase of putting all this together. Yes, we have worked on it for a while as a board, but um, but as far as you know, getting once you sign the purchase and sales, you can actually get someone in there to look at the state of the building, and you can actually start talking with the financial places uh, with and. So it's uh, signing that purchase and sales agreement opened up a whole other level of uh, work for the board and staff. <laughs> so you all are going to have to help me remember. I counted back. Were you next? Yeah. Okay. Um, so Annie, you mentioned uh, both the purchase and sales agreement as well as the fact that the board could move forward with this decision uh, without the, the members voting to approve it. Um, could you clarify where we are in the process of, of making this decision? Do we do we need member approval? Do we not? If we do, is it a simple majority? Just just a general clarification of where we are. The, so um, the board decided that they did not want to make any decisions for the for the membership, and we wanted to involve the membership in that. So we've got these two informational meetings. Again, they're being recorded. They're on the co-op's website. They're also at the community access TV. Um, site. Um, after these two meetings is the annual meeting, uh, which is on October 10th, um, and that starts a two-week voting process that will be in the store and online. We're putting that package together now. Um, in signing that purchase and sales agreement, everything was contingent on the membership voting to do this. If the membership votes no, then all deals are off and we're back to square one. Um, does that answer that question? Um, and what, uh, what percentage of the membership needs to vote to approve? What's the threshold? Is it a simple majority? It's a simple majority, yes. It's got to be act, it's active members that are paid up in their dues, and at this point, we probably have about 1,200 members. There might be a little bit more. I'm not completely clear on the numbers at this point, but it, it fluctuates a little bit. <laughs> um, and then, can I make oh, a yeah. correction to that? So there, it's a simple majority of five percent of the membership, according to bylaws. Okay, so only the people five in the back here. Might only five. I'm sorry. Only five percent of the membership can make this decision, and it's a simple majority of that five percent. And that's according to the bylaws. So we obviously want a whole lot more input than five percent, and I would love to see a hundred percent. Thank you. And then going back. Yeah, and this is sort of follow up about the debt to income figures. Is that that stuff is online though is it not available from the feasibility like what income we expect to make and then how much debt we're taking on is that are those numbers going to be available to us they will be I'm the reason you see me my I, we just posted some stuff today i don't remember if it includes that yeah my suspicion would be that we would be posting making transparent any of that information yeah right? how much debt is coming if it's not up now sources. it will be up soon <laughs> it's the asset value that Yep. And then as that information comes in, probably also, yeah. Did you have a, no, that was it, also? Okay, and then going back, is Eric here next? Yeah. I just have a clarification yeah. in terms of the information coming to me. Um, a lot of it feels abstract, and I, my reality is, is a grounded real world. 
where we're dealing with a community that is looking to have food to eat to satisfy their nutrition and their hunger. And so a lot of this information coming to me is really abstract in these matrices and so forth. And I'm wondering if there's other information that deals with the relationship of the diversity of this community, of the either or that seems to have been here for many decades that we can bring forward rather than some of these prophecies of matrices and business that don't seem to have any reality to do with feeding our community. Mm -hmm. And so um, in terms of information about feeding the community, are you wondering about feasibility studies of what a product mix would look like in the store or? Um, I'm just, I, I can look around and see that probably most of this group is is on one side of the community. So we, we, we don't have the whole community being represented in their need for eating food here. And so in terms of a membership voting, an exclusive group of this community being the only ones able to vote on this move, it doesn't involve the relationship of bringing us together as a hub for the whole community. So I'm going to ask for part of that question to go into the discussion groups because I, that also came up a lot at the first meeting of what does the community mix look like and how do we make that work and is it possible. So I encourage folks to pick that up in the smaller discussion groups. But I'm also going to take it, if there is, as a clarifying question, was there anything um, in the feasibility studies or anything where we had specific input from people who are not co -op, current co-op members. Our market feasibility study that had 700 respondents that included a decent amount of non-members. I don't remember the percentage off my top of my head, but that was one way that we got input from them. Do you remember? So three. Did you hear that? 300 non-members out of the 700. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Go back. Yes. We'll be um, putting the entire market feasibility study on the website soon. So you can Hopefully see we'll all of the details in that. Okay. Yes. Question. I'm just wondering, as part of the feasibility study, like, has any co op ever merged with a non co op entity and tried to have it under one roof with members? Because conventional businesses do not have members. So. Mm -hmm. Like to me, that seems like like yep. like it's a yeah. huge challenge. What what's being proposed? Um, so in answer to that, there there are a few co-ops that are that what I call cross market. They sell to um, conventional and natural food or whatever you want. To, I don't know natural food, organic food. There are both of those that it exists. City Market, when they got the contract for the downtown grocery store, they um, the, the city mandated that they carry 60% conventional and 40% natural foods. Within three years, they presented data back to the city managers and said, look, here's what we're actually selling. It's 60% natural foods and only 40% conventional. At that point, that part of the contract was became null and void. Littleton Co-op over in New Hampshire also does cross-marketing. Uh, Hanover Co-op, which is the second oldest, oldest co-op in the country, started in the 20s during the Depression. Um, also, an Adamant Co-op, which in Adamant, Vermont, is actually the oldest food co-op in the country, and they also sell a mixed product line. Those are all pretty, well, Adamant is, a being unto itself because it's in this teeny little community in the middle of nowhere, which I only ever seem to find when I'm getting lost in that area. <laughs> um, but the other ones are fairly successful. I mean, as much as, I mean, it's hard, like, like Emily said earlier, the margin on food is so minuscule. Um, I think what we're trying to do here in terms of two existing businesses going under one roof is somewhat novel. I don't know of another one that's done it that way. Littleton started out saying, we are going to carry both. Hanover brought natural food on when natural food started to become a thing. They were a pre-existing grocery store. And City Market also was, they were um, Onion River Co-op that did natural food. They 
put in a bid to become the downtown area grocery store when the chain grocery store left the city um, and won that bid um, and um, took on, as I said, the uh, commitment that they made with the city to carry both product. Right. So then is it fair to say that this kind of information cannot exist in the feasibility study because it has never happened? Hmm. Because if you, if, like it's beautiful that there are stores carrying both, but so does Hannaford's and Price Chopper. They have fake, you know, organic files where they're trying to appease the trend. But if this has never been done before, which is what you're saying, then we have no idea about the feasibility of the clashing of the two cultures of people who refuse to shop at Tops or refuse to shop at the market because they will only shop at the co-op. And therefore, the people who are subject, the lesser folks who shop at, at the market, and I, for, you know, forgive me for saying that, but I was a lesser folk once where I had to shop at Walmart to feed my daughter. And when I first got involved with organic farming, I had to shut my mouth about what my practice was in consumerism so I could survive, to not be treated like an underling by other people until I established like some rapport with them. And then I could say, well, you know, like in order for me to survive, I shopped at Walmart. You know, so but, let, so me, let just, me bring this, that's a huge let me bring it back to the feasibility study because yeah. I feel like the yeah, clarification, sorry. that's okay, but I feel like the clarification that we can give, and you all correct me if I'm wrong, is that the feasibility study was based on a survey, based on, well, th there were two studies, but they're based on the survey, based on the actual financials, and based on projections, and based on other similar models, although, as Annie pointed out, nothing is exactly the same. So that's what the feasibility study was based on, because that's what we have. So were there other original Over questions there. going back the first round? I see you there. I just want to see, was there anybody in front that I had missed? Okay. Yep, I got you. There you go. There you go here. Um, I have a friend that was concerned about the people that work there, mm -hmm. that she really likes them, and she really, really likes the butcher. And she was wondering if they were all going to lose their jobs. And the thing is, you keep talking about feasibility studies, all these studies, but have you put any surveys or any kind of information over there for those, the people that shop there regularly and uh, to involve them in this? And I think if we're going to have a strong community here where that store is closing or a lot of people will miss it, then um, I, I understand that it could be hard to, to mix the two, but I think it's the only way that um, it seems like a very important way to survive would be to pull other people in and not feel so like the co-op is so sit and singled out as something, you know, this thing. And, and then this is like a regular store kind of thing. To get everybody feeling comfortable there, find yep. some way to do that. Thank you for your questions and comments. And the reason why I keep bringing it back to the feasibility studies at this point is because right now we're just trying to answer questions about what information we already have and then I'm hoping to get to the part where you all can ask questions of each other and bring up things that have not already been addressed. So I'm also going to ask some of those questions to go into the small conversation groups. Um, I, want, there I do was, want to say we did there, meet with their staff there, <laughs> a few weeks ago. Right. So, so we, we have been talking with them, um, and we and everybody came to that meeting pretty nervous, and we all left feeling very hopeful and positive. As Emily said in that meeting, because they were concerned about having their jobs, she said, I am not interested in firing everyone. We don't know what our staffing needs are. Certainly you have expertise in this store. And in a time of many businesses looking for labor because they're short staffed, the idea of being overstaffed sounds really appealing. <laughs> And I heard a second clarifying question. Was there anything that's already happened um, to solicit information from the current staff and current um, shoppers at the Village Market? So the other clarifying question that I heard was that, was, 
have there been any efforts to solicit, gather information from the staff at Village Market? It, we already mentioned that there was one meeting. So outside that one meeting, was there, were there, have there been any efforts to gather information from current staff and to gather information from the current shoppers at the Village Market? Has that, as a clarifying question, has that happened? The original survey was out on, uh, uh, for the market study, was put out in publicly in places on like Front Porch Forum, and there was information in the Gazette, and there was, you know, there was different ways, you, tr you know, you try to get stuff out there, you never know how much you're going to get back in, you know, you, you, you do the best to get the info out there. That said, yes, we could stand out in the doorway over there and hand out paper surveys or something like that. But we haven't got there yet. There, there's... Oh, good God, we need to not put that there. <laughs> there's, there's a level of intrusion. You know, that's like a functioning business that we don't own yet. We have a purchase and sale agreement. Um, there's a certain level of, you know, respect for them running their business in terms of, of getting really involved. And I'm... I want to make something clear. Like we keep going back to the uh, what is it called? The feasibility study, and there's sort of this gray area in terms of the merging the two stores. And when we were framing this thing, um, it wasn't clear when we were framing this the long history of that store in this town. Like that that wasn't baked in. You know, some of us were thinking it in the backs of our heads. But that really emerged as that thing was being presented. You know, the, the importance of that store, the importance of those unseen relationships. That, that wasn't front and center. So, I mean, you all are seeing it, right? That it's, it's not there. It's because it wasn't. And I'm not going to pretend that it was um, in front of all of you. It's a, a, an emergent property. The, one of our board members, just so you know. the results of the survey, a lot of the questions are broken down by like member versus non-member. So you can look at the results and see like, well, what did the members think? What did the non-members think about these different questions? So non-members doesn't necessarily mean people that don't shop at the co-op. They're just not members. So well, members doesn't mean, doesn't mean people who don't do most of their shopping somewhere else. Yeah. <laughs> so. yeah, yeah. Are you, I just want to say that I did post this meeting at the Village Market so that the Village Market shoppers would be aware that this meeting was happening and that it wasn't just for co-op members, it's for, it's, it's a community. Thank you. Okay, so let me take a show of hands again if who else has a clarifying question just so I can get my head around this. Wowie. Okay. So I'm going to go one, two, three four, five, and then we're going to try to break it into small groups. So you five people help me remember the order I just said. There you go. Um, this is just a clarifying question or that I heard from the Gazette uh, reporter here that, that nicotine or tobacco and um, lottery tickets are totally off the market. I mean, off the table, I guess. Yes. Off the table. Yes. So that decision was made collectively by the board. Yes? No? We, at, we, we talked to the owners and said, these two things we do not, absolutely do not want to carry. And they said, that's fine. Okay. That they would they were not buying cigarettes. We're not buying them. cigarettes to resell them in the store at this point. They, were, they will sell down their inventory. They will, and the state will, I don't know how lottery tickets work, whether they find someplace else to sell them in town or whatever. I'm sure the gas station will be excited and have a booming business in both cigarettes and lottery tickets. <laughs> what about the lottery tickets? I didn't even realize they sold lottery tickets. So, at the market? Yeah. Did they yes. Did they sell lottery tickets? Yes. Everything. So the second question going back was, uh, Ellen. I, I had a clarifying question maybe about the inventory and I forgot to ask this before. Um, does the village market 
uh, is the Village Market on the WIC program, the Women, Infants, and Children thing? Yes. Because I know our co-op had tried for years. We would love to support it. We can take SNAP benefits, but we cannot take the WIC uh, program because of our product mix. They're very specific about what what brands and what actual products were. Can you on the back for that? The question was um, whether Village Market uh, had, can sell, participate, participate in the WIC program, and therefore, if we were to buy the business, would we be able to participate in the WIC program, which we've had a hard, which the co-op has had a hard time being able to do in the past. Does everybody know what the WIC program is? Women, infant, and children. It helps with the uh, nutrition. That's a great question because we don't have the answer. <laughs> um, but that is also um, a good reminder for me to say that all of the questions and conversation that's coming out of this meeting, as well as the first meeting, as well as whatever feedback and questions and comments people are sending in to the co-op all along, you know, the past couple of weeks and the few weeks going forward, is all going to be fed back out to all of us in a, in a um, bullsheet edition, in another newsletter. So um, if, we, if there aren't factual answers tonight, there will be opportunities to get that information out in the future. So we had one, two, and then there's three in the back. Was that you, Mr. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just want to clarify, when did the board when was the board approach by uh, the owners of the village market for this current situation we're in. The second time? When were they approached? When was the board, yeah, this current situation that we're, you know, exploring. We approached them. The okay, time. how how long ago was that? Wow, do we remember when that was? Uh, pardon me? You don't know. Six months, eight months. Has it been a year? It's probably been, I don't think it's been quite a year, but it's getting towards a year. Okay, that's interesting. So, uh, um, really concerned about the lack of transparency. Um, since I left the co-op three years ago, I feel like I have no idea what's going on in the co-op. So Except for like a little like, oh, just no, let me get to the point of like, okay, thank you. that board minutes, since we just were, the members were notified of this sale and this potential, the board minutes haven't been updated for almost a year. I kept checking the website and we couldn't find updated board minutes until recently. And it was like the whole year got put on. So I'm just curious why, well, that's that's irrelevant. But I just, that's interesting that it's been a year and this is our first time being notified as members of this potential. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah I take that free. Uh, Chris and talk loud. Okay, I'm Chris I'm a board member. Um, we were in a non-disclosure agreement with the tracks, so we couldn't re reveal anything. They didn't want it to know. Uh, they didn't want any of this information out. They didn't want people coming into their store saying, "Hey, you know, you're going to be," which they did. People have done recently. You're going to be out of the job in a week. So they didn't want the disruption to their business to happen. So they asked us to keep it under wraps as much as we could. So we weren't trying to hide anything, and I think, you know, if anybody on the board would agree with me, we weren't, you know, we did go into executive session quite a bit about it because it's a contract negotiation type thing, um, and we do have that privilege. But we weren't trying to hide anything for you. Is that why the board minutes weren't posted? The board minutes have been posted. Yeah, I, I, post, I post the board minutes on the Google site, and which then goes to the website, and I've been posting them all along, so I don't know. They're, they're, they're free. Yeah. Um, that, I, I swear to God, this spring I've been checking <coughs> and just become curious what's going on. And so, so I'm going there hasn't any, been any updated since last September. That's not true. I, I'm going to suggest, because it's important, <laughs> that um, outside of this meeting, and it could be just as soon as we're over, that um, someone get in touch touch base with Free and anybody else that's had a hard time getting hold of the minutes to make sure that that happens, that folks that want access to it have access to it. And as the clarifying part of this, there won't be anything about this move potential or option until the purchase and sale agreement, which was a couple weeks ago. But other than that, it should all be available 
Um, and if someone, in addition to free, hasn't been able to get it, make sure that you talk to one of the board members or Emily so that you can have access to it. Okay, I remember there were five questions. <laughs> so we're up to uh, four and five, I believe. Ruth. Can you tell us about the plan is for the existing building? Will it be sold? Will our vote be based on the existing building? So is there a current plan for our existing co-op building? We own that building outright. And uh, the plan is it's being used as, the, as part of our collateral for getting a loan. And the plan is within two years to sell it, try to sell it. Um, obviously, if someone wants to get it sooner, we would be happy to do that um, and or rent it. Uh, you know, yes, we, are, we don't want an empty storefront on Main Street. We're not bailing on Main Street. Um, so the, the future plan is to not be owning that building. And as soon as we can you know, find a new owner or tenant for it, we will be doing that. Okay, I, I don't want to take any new questions after the ones that I counted out before. I believe you were one of them, Steve, and Jennifer, were you one, Russell? That was my question. Oh, great. Steve, you're going to close out this section of clarifying questions. Yeah, I've got a couple of um, financial questions. Um, one involves the interest rate that we're paying. Um, I believe it's 3.85%, which is pretty pretty low, but of course this is a, a time of historically low interest rates. How long will that rate last? I don't remember. 10 or 15 years, 15. I can look at my notes. 15? Yeah. Um, and have there been any projections of what would happen if the interest rate jumped significantly at that point? Um, roughly, I you know the feasibility study that one time you looked at it and it said we're forty thousand dollars in debt the first year. That's because I plugged in the numbers of what it would look like if we um, if it was a higher interest rate. I think I I don't know put something really high in. That's the first year when we're like barely making any money. Once we get five years out, it looked like if we could have a greatly increased interest rate and still be fine. It's not a precise thing that you're asking, but we've done a little bit of playing with that to see what it would look like. And my second question involves the, um, there's a page built on the website and in the bullshit that's Can We Do This? Where it says that the break even point is 3.67 million, and that the first year you're projecting 3.9 million, and it says that that's 30,000 more than the break even point. It's actually 230,000 more. Which is nearly a quarter of a million more than what you're saying break even is. But then when you look at the um, spreadsheet below for that first year, doing three, uh, almost a quarter of a million more than break even, it says that we're losing money that first year, $1,400 or something. So what is the break even? I can look at my notes to see, but I think this is a better question for Catherine Bessie, who is totally available to answer questions and get that back to you. Okay, thank you all for your patience in listening to the large group and also for your tolerance of me cutting it off for now. Um, I really want to make sure that we have time for people to break into small groups, small groups because it's a little bit easier to participate a little bit more fully, um, to break into small groups, to start asking each other questions and sharing ideas and concerns and opinions with each other so that um, we're all kind of juiced to think about this from as many perspectives as possible as we're making the decisions. If you want to use them in each of the small groups, you can use these as your prompts for the discussion. Is it possible for you and the group to talk about and figure out what's the most exciting possibility ahead of us if we were to do this move? And also, what would be the biggest question, the, the thing that um, like you really want to have answered or you really want to figure out um, in order to be able to make a decision? The groups don't have to focus on those things, but if you sit down and look at each other like, well, now what do we do? That's one place to start. So you'll see that there are four pads of paper. 
I'd like to suggest that you all break into four groups. If um, you're able to and if you're comfortable, try to sit in a group with folks that you wouldn't talk to otherwise or you might not talk to as frequently because this is your opportunity to really mix and hear a lot of people's ideas and share ideas with each other. Um, you also, when you all gather and drag your chair, chairs around, right? So drag your chair to one of the stations. And um, I would also suggest that you start just simply by introducing yourselves <laughs> and then get into a conversation. Um, I'm, it's now 10 after seven. So we're gonna try about 20 minutes. I'll check in with each group and see how that's working, but we're gonna aim for around 20 minutes so that we have time to come back as a large group and share some of the, the conversation, the highlights of the conversations that happened. And also if there are any further questions, we can try to pull it together at the end. This is a big decision and a lot of information and um, it might not all get discussed and resolved tonight, but hopefully this is what's gonna get us all started and get our wheels turning so that we can keep these conversations going with each other, with folks that aren't here, and also if you have factual questions or concerns to keep sending them into the co-op. Like I said, there will be a, another bull sheet that's coming out, so if you get your concerns and ideas into the co-op, we'll, the co-op staff will be able to turn that around and share it with a much larger audience, whoever happens to read the newsletter. So if you would now please drag your chairs towards one of the four corners. I just, I just wanted to point out the board members who are here tonight and will be in the different groups. So if you have specific questions, we'll answer them as, as best we can. Um, and that's um, Heather Davis. Uh, Jacqueline, I saw her. But she, oh, there you are. Jacqueline, uh, David Liu. Annie, myself, Catherine. Catherine, Arnold, everybody knows Catherine. So, so we're all board members and we'll, we'll be either in your group or circulating if you have any questions. All right. So what I'm going to do is ask um, the folks that are up here from some of the small groups to, as best you can, just highlight a couple of highlights from your group. If it fits into the most exciting possibility and the biggest question or stumbling block, great. If it doesn't, just a couple of points. All right. Hi, everybody. So we were grouped this corner, and we took this thing to me. We were supposed to come up with one most exciting possibility and one biggest question. So our most exciting possibility is called potential with an exclamation point. And then it has subheadings called outdoor space, bakery, reach the entire community inclusively and with less division. So that's our most exciting possibility. They, they were warned, I think. <laughs> So this seemed like the way to make the group inclusive again. Go <laughs> Paul. So, and our biggest question was, can we be affordable for all in appropriate product categories, etc.? Thank you. Okay, we talked about a lot of stuff. Um, let's see. If some of the main points, if I can look at my here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, some of the main points for our group discussion um, was like uh, some questions were concerns about the moving to the new location and the visa like talking about the feasibility of it and um like how how that like how let's see what was it what was it going to be concern about moving to the loop to the new location like in times of instability um, another thing we talked about was um 
the new location being a place for everyone in the community to come together and shop together and get to meet more of their neighbors at the new space. Um, so another concern was non-co-op members to just to make that a group of people, I guess, who shop at the village market um, concerned about making them feel welcome in a building owned by the co-op and making and you know um, knowing that some people don't shop at the co-op because they don't feel welcome. Another big thing, um, the, yeah, the current space is not inviting, lacks storage space, leaky roof, not handicap accessible, so the new building would be great to fix a lot of those um, problems. And uh, the staff morale at the current building, um, the stuff breaking down all the time, at the current location is really stressful for a lot of the staff. Uh, another concern might be moving might detrimentally affect the Galaxy bookstore. So those were those were some of our stuff we talked about. Um, we also talked a lot about though just making it a community store, taking politics out of it and like food choices and just making it a place where everyone can get food because that's just basically what we all want and need no matter what we believe in or you know stuff like that so that that was the summary thank you thanks all right next up <laughs> so we kind of narrowed it down a little bit um so with exciting things uh the possibility of merging different groups of the community that don't always interact as much as we should. Um, you know, co-op shoppers and village market shoppers. Um, to, to have an, ex an ADA accessible place would be good for everybody, of course. Having parking available, you know, we talked about how some people don't shop at the co-op specifically because they can't park there or they don't like to parallel park. Um, and volume of scale, that there's a possibility of having products um, available cheaper through different organizations that we can't, or companies that we can't buy through currently. Um, so we might be able to get organic products cheaper and other conventional conventional products at a lower cost than we can get it than go up and get them at now. Um, questions are how to keep it accessible to um, people who don't shop at the co-op currently to make sure that they feel like the it's a place where they are comfortable coming and shopping. Um, we we also raised the concern that other people had about the uh, other businesses on Main Street if that's going to impact their business. Um, what's going to go into the old, the current building, if that's going to be something that will be good for the whole community. Um, so I'm not sure what the last one was there. Acquisition, yeah, it was thought of as an acquisition. <laughs> right, and that kind of animosity with the village market, that there people don't feel like it's emerging, but more of an acquisition. Thank you. The picnic table group. So we came up with um, some of, I think there was quite a bit of uh, maintain the small store attitude, bigger space without the corporate model, a corporate alternative. Um, we're concerned about the supply chain disruption and there's been um, talk, uh, I was talking to another person anyway, it just came up that maybe we could start our own distribution um, chain because the chain, supply chain disruption is, um, is probably coming. And uh, we want to be one as a community, but we're concerned about GMOs, and we want to ensure the f quality of the food, which um, we already have a lot of GMO products in the, in the co-op right now. And that is pure poison, and I'm just inserting that myself. Um, there's, uh, someone was really interested in maintaining the, the ability to charge food and a buying, having a buying club, and then the bulk pricing um, with quality food, so that um, I know that it's been hard with the co-ops to buy something bulk and 
and save a bunch of money because there's always a big markup on it still. Um, I think that used to be different where um, people would go in and break up the food into smaller quantities. So I think that was a lot of it was the quality of the food. Um, we want to be one as a community, but it's um, we're already carrying a lot of GMO laced foods, and if we go into um, mixing the foods more, which we do want to, you know, it's hard because you want to include the whole community, but uh, we we don't want to be selling a lot of poisonous food, as we already have uh, we already have more of than that than anybody realizes in the store right now. Excellent. Thank you. So um, thank you all for your participation and also your patience with me because I am pushing you to keep moving along here. And I'm going to do it for the next 10 minutes. We have 10 more minutes for the formal meeting. Someone asked, can we just meet longer? Yes, you may meet longer, but the uh, kind of formal part of this meeting is going to be done at 8 o'clock, just to respect that limit. If folks want to stay and talk longer, please do. And by all means, please keep these conversations going outside of this meeting. That's really the most important part, is that the conversations keep going, keep going and include more and more people so that we can all share information and really digest all the different pieces of this so that we can make intelligent decisions together, right? So, 10 minutes, this is the free for all part. I'm not going to limit you with clarifying questions or this or that. Um, and I realized I should do a better job at taking a stack. So if you want to speak, please raise your hand. Let me see how many folks we have. Woo, okay. Can you bring them up if possible? Yes. Um, it would be helpful for the camera if you come to speak up here. If you're not comfortable doing that, um, you can write stuff down in the back, and I will read it for you. But let me see the hands again. I'm going to ask you for your names. Cool. I'm actually going to hold you to about a minute apiece, okay? In 10 minutes, I'm going to be out of your hair, and you can talk as long as you want. But I've got seven folks. You've each got about a minute. Emily. There's a little information that we hadn't shared yet that I want to just go over. And that's our timeline, because we haven't talked about that yet. Basically, we have these meetings. We have an annual meeting on October 10th, and then we have voting for two weeks. We're hoping by the beginning of November we can have information about how the vote went, if not sooner. Um, at that point, soon after, we'll be launching a capital campaign, meaning figuring out fundraising, because that's part of getting the money for this sale, for this purchase. <laughs> and then um, the closing date is January 6th um, for closing it. And then their renovations and stuff would have to happen. So that timeline isn't 100% solid yet, how we're going to do that. But we have, we know the scope of work is. So I want to let you all know that piece. Great. Paul, I want to. It'll be in the next bull sheet, which will come out before the meeting. And it's on our website. It's easy to find there. But we can we can put a sign up if you'd like us to. That's totally fine to do that. But <laughs> no problem. I can probably talk loud enough without the microphone. So my question is really to the board and management of the co-op that I think it's really important that we know exactly and as far in advance as possible what question will be put to us to vote on on the 10th because at this point I guess we've got a general idea but knowing what the question is what our vote will count for I assume the board may have the ability to make other decisions based on the contingencies that we haven't even heard about so but I think it's important as soon as possible for us to know what we're going to be asked to vote on. Thank you. Alan. Uh, 
Um, I'm a I'm I'm newcomer in this area, but I'm a I'm a 30-year co-op fan and and act and p active participant. And I just think it's important at times like this to remember a couple of fundamentals. One of which is a co-op isn't about the type of product that's that's being marketed. It's about who owns the the means of marketing those products. And a co-op is everybody who's a member owns it and has a say in the direction and destiny of the organization. And this is the kind of time when you need to remember that. Um, Tops, I've shopped there. I don't know who the manager or the owner is, but it does. They don't, you know, the owner doesn't live here. And I haven't shopped at the uh, at the um, at the village market. I hear they're nice people who are part of the community, and that's great, and that should be embraced no matter what going forward. But if the if the co-op remembers some of the principles of cooperatives, like membership is open to all, and it should be actively cultivated all the time, and that constant education of the members is one of the one of the bedrocks of all co-ops. That takes care if if the co if the co-op will really embrace that and fall back on it, that takes care of the huge issue of, of sort of getting cultural meshing um, between the different kinds of people in the community and the different tastes that they have when they go shopping. And and that needs to be respected for everyone for this to be successful. Thank you. Okay, Stacy got your minute. Thank you. Oh, so it's, it's yeah, good. good. Um, so first of all, I have to just say, uh, as a new Vermonter, a new local person, I'm just overwhelmed at how welcoming everybody is. And I feel like just being at this one meeting, a huge difference in the comfort level that I have in kind of what's happening in the dialogue that's open, which is really beautiful. Um, and I, th I think it's really fascinating that part of what came out of the, the topics that we talked about in the small group was this local food uh, network that kind of needs to be there. And that's something as a former Hudson Valley resident surrounded you know, in an agricultural community that is a brilliant way to have something that could be a foundation for people who are concerned about you know, GMO or not and where our food is coming from and security. But the other thing that came up in our conversation that I thought was really brilliant was talking about like the next generation of who's going to be shopping is really important. So as much as I like had concern from what I heard from people in the community before coming here was like, well, what happens to the folks at the market? Does it feel like a takeover? You know, does the co-op again reign supreme? And it's like, okay, well, these are politically charged things that don't really have much to do with community. It has to do with outside ideas. So I think it's beautiful that people are talking about, like, how can we go about, as a community, being, like, more proactive neighbors and just talk to more people about, like, like we're people who have children who are sons and daughters of people who were children <laughs> and then you know we have children so that to me is the core vital piece so whether there's some junk at the co-op you know which I think is a symptom of the ills in our community that we have to look further within ourselves is like what do we need because I love junky food but I really love beautiful, real, gorgeous tomatoes that somebody who loves to grow them grows. And I love that people practice husbandry, practice a direct connection to the earth and provide and share what it is that they create. And we, yes, so I just wanted to say that and I really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, this is when I get really tough here. We've got Free, Eric, and then Chris. A minute each if you can. Come on up. Um, so I'm, I'm a little concerned about the timeline that we have. 
it seems like a really pretty important decision to make for our co-op and it has a lot of ramifications if we somehow make the wrong decision. Um, is there any possible way to extend that, the vote? Because I think a month for us to like make a decision on this is not enough. Um, the first thing that jumped in my mind when we were doing this and maybe combining like non-organic food, a lot more conventional foods, is the competition for small growers. Small scale growers like myself and all the other growers that we have at the co-op. Um, we have that competition already externally outside of the co-op. But when you have 50 cents a pound potatoes next to $1.80 a pound potatoes or onions, whatever, I think people are going to make more decisions to steer away from local. And that really concerns me. Um, uh, uh, I'm so tired. I've been up since 3.30 this week. Um, is, uh, oh, Well, the other thing was, uh, is there any potential to uh, maybe take on a similar model to the Upper Valley Food Co-op? Um, we used to be collectively managed, and, and I'm curious if that's something that we could bring back. Like, they have a three-member management team, and I think that would be, this is a big endeavor, you know, and, and this is something that's pretty substantial, and I think if we had more hands on deck, to help with that. Um, so I'm going to have to forget it. Yeah. But definitely the concern about the local growers. Thank you. Thank you. Eric, you're looking at Mike? Sure. There you go. I'm all about the one. The one for all and the all for one. And so, using these words in this strange language to express the one becomes very challenging. So I'm going to try it. I use these words, and these words, we say, a picture is worth a thousand words. And so then I go further and I say, a feeling is worth a thousand pictures. And then I say, the prime mover is behind the feeling. And so, when I try to convey to you my love of this experience of life, it's a dream within a dream within a dream. And so my, my gratitude and my wish for all of us is that we come from that place of commonality when we look at this love that we have of this life. Thank you. That's a tough one to follow. I know. <laughs> That's a tough one to follow. I actually just have some clarifying information. This is not a done deal. There are a lot of contingencies between here and when we, you know, sign off on this. Currently, the date is January 6th for the closing, which is pretty quick, free, and the date is uh, the the vote is coming up pretty quickly too. <clears throat> but. That's part of a contingency. They're not going to wait forever to sell this place. So it's an opportunity, um, and we have deadlines mixed into that opportunity, and they're all written into this purchase and sale agreement. So we do have all these deadlines. But most importantly, I want you to know that there are a lot of contingencies, not the least the membership approval. So if not enough people want this to happen, it's not going to happen uh, of the membership. Um, other contingencies, you know, building, inspection, you know, and, and that's a big one. A lot of outs there that we could have. You know, so I don't want anybody to feel like this is it. You know, we do have some opportunities to move within this um, and think about it some more free, you know. So, um, and then I, I wanted to reiterate what Emily said, that the vote does start on the 10th. You know, speak to your fellow co-op members and get them out there to vote and vote and vote. Let's get, you know, I mentioned 5% as the minimum. Let's see if we can, you know, kill it, you know, get a ton of people. Um, there was one other thing, but uh, it's not that important if I didn't remember it. <laughs> all right. So thank you all for coming out. Next group meeting is going to be October 10th. That's the co-op annual meeting.
Voting starts then and goes for two weeks after. Please, please, please keep sharing information, share your ideas, share your thoughts, keep talking to folks, because we all need that. We all need everybody's best thinking on this decision. Thanks so much. Have a good night. <laughs>